Hey, uh, this morning we're going to continue our series that we started last week. And, uh, and uh, I want to just uh, uh, turn your attention. The, the kind of couple verses that we're going to start in are uh, Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 8 through 9. Uh, and I want to I wanna read this to you uh, because um, it's an interesting... Um, it's an interesting dynamic of our faith. This is the kind of the moments of, uh, that have made a grim, great impact on our faith. And uh, so I want you to turn there. But I want you, have you ever thought about this reality today? This reality of the fact that um, uh, how amazing it is that each and every day we have an opportunity um, to uh, be in the presence of God. I just want you to think about the amazing reality of this. And when I look into Genesis, in this account in chapter 2, uh, and starting in verse 8 and 9, uh, I, I'm just amazed at the reality that God came to spend time with the people he created. It must have been so overwhelming and so good in those moments before sin entered the world. It talks about how God came in the cool of the day. And you know what's amazing is, that I don't know how you picture that time and that piece in the Bible there in Genesis where it says God comes to meet with Adam and Eve. When I was little, I kind of just imagined some dude strolling through the garden just to hang out with a couple other dudes. But I want you to understand, I want you to understand as I've gotten older, what I've realized is, is that please in that image, as you see that image, don't rob God of his glory. Because when God comes to the man and woman in the garden, he's coming with the fullness of his glory. And how do I know that? Because when you read the account, it says that Adam and Eve heard God walking through the garden. They heard God walking through the garden. Now listen, in life, there are very few things that are big enough to be heard in the garden before you see them. And usually most of them are not things we want to meet. Right? When you hear the rustling of the trees and you hear the thumping of the ground and the... I didn't even plan for that effect, but I like it. <laughs> and you start to hear something's coming in the garden. You go... I think I want to turn around and go the other way because it gives us the impression of something large, something much bigger, much more powerful than me is coming my way. And that's how we know as we read into the account of God meeting with Adam and Eve in the garden, he's there with all his glory so, because when he shows up, all of his glory shows up with him and he's there to meet. And what a powerful, what a powerful example. There's a few things... Uh, today that we, I want to take out of this passage. First, I want to read it to you. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 8. It says, Now the Lord had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye, and good for food. I think you should underline that because when Eve says that the, uh, that the other tree is pleasing, just know they were all pleasing. They were all pleasing. Pleasing uh, to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden, uh, there was a tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It, uh, and so, so God planted all these wonderful things of creation in the garden. And then he put a tree of knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. Now I want you to skip down with me to verse 15 through 17. And it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, You are free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Amen. You will certainly die. One day, all of a sudden, God comes into the garden. They can hear him because he's coming with all his glory. And when he came to them, this time was different. Because unlike the other times where Adam and Eve were glad to see him, and they, I imagine, 
came looking for him when they heard him because there was no obstacle in relationship. There was no obstacle in their intimacy. All of a sudden, today was different. They were hiding. They hid. And God called out to them. In fact, it says God specifically called out to man. He called out to the man, where are you? Where are you? And all of a sudden, a place of fellowship that was common was now being avoided. God had never asked where they were before because they were present. God never had to tell them to come close because they automatically did. They had relationship. They had a daily habit of being in the presence of God and not thinking anything about it because this was normal. Daily communion presence with God. And when Adam finally presented himself, God asked, what are you hiding for? Why are you hiding? And this was not man's greatest moment. In fact, I would just say, of all the moments in history of men, this is probably one of our worst. Because Adam says, this woman you gave me, She gave me some and I ate it. Okay, just so we notice and we're just square before we keep going on. Uh, Adam is pace, placing the blame in two places. Number one, on the woman, and number two, on God, because she's the one, he's the one who gave her, gave her to him. Not one of our brightest moments. But he began to quickly blame others for what really lived in him. And even, he even tried to get God to take some of the responsibility. Now, we know this story as the fall. This is what's considered the fall. Because before this moment, there was great relationship and fellowship with God and man. Unhindered, unobstructed. God's glory, man, in all, and, and, and together in relationship and intimacy. And the fall represents what happens after the decision is made for that to now be complicated. And so in, 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 in these scriptures here, we see what took place. There was a decision. There was a choice that was made. This decision set off generation after generation of people struggling to be able to experience God in that kind of intimacy again. Because no longer was it just us and God. It was now God and us in a ginormous mountain of my mistakes and regrets and choices and consequences. Shame, feelings of guilt. All of that now is entered into my relationship with God, making it complicated, making it difficult, making it feel obstructed, which is the result of our hiding from him and not coming. We hide too, just like he did. You see, living in the world that we live in, it's tempting to ask the question, why even put the tree there to begin with? Why put the tree there to begin with? If he loved them so much, why not just create the garden without the tree? Let's call it good, and everybody stays in relationship, no problems. Why put the tree there? In fact, many critics of Christianity and the Christian faith, actually, this is one of their first arguments. God's not as good as you say he is, and he doesn't love you like you say he is, because if he did, he wouldn't have put the tree there. We're talking about making sense of faith, and there's some things in our faith that sometimes, if we don't dig down deep enough, might not make sense to us. And what it means to make sense is to grasp something, to understand something, to be able to accurately judge something. And when we, uh, when we look at something and it doesn't make sense to us, it gives us the kind of feelings and, and thoughts sometimes that stuff doesn't really add up. It doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. I can't really wrap my mind around that concept. And when we can't wrap our mind around a concept and when things don't make sense to us, sometimes it causes us to have a negative reaction to it. And so I want to just dig in a little bit to this thought. Why did God put the tree in the garden? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. In many ways, we like Adam associate our propensity with, uh, for sin 
with God didn't do, me, uh, do enough to keep me from it. Did you hear that? We think the sin in our life is got kind of a, a result of that is because God didn't do enough to keep me out of it. Why did he create me with the desires I have? If he knew that I was going to have these desires, then he would know with all that temptation out in the world, I would surely fall. Why didn't he do enough to protect me? Why didn't he do enough to keep me from it? It is possible that you have grown up knowing the details of this story. The tree in the garden, the fall of man, the decision made, the sin entering the world, but never understood or never even uh, uh, comprehended the meaning behind it. You took God's word uh, at his word, which is great. You believed it, but you missed what he wanted to say through, to you through it. Today we're going to look at the three life lessons and the message that God wants to give us through his creation and his purposeful choice of putting the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden. Three life lessons. And the first is this. God wants uh, most, what God wants most for me is for me to experience his love. For me to experience his love. Hang on with me for a second. You're going to see it. See, one of the biggest misconceptions about creation is that God somehow was lonely and he needed us. We say God created us so that he could have relationship with someone because he was lonely. He needed or wanted community, some source of love, some source of relationship. I want to remind you today that that's theologically incorrect. Number one, because God already, uh, first of all, God is perfect. Secondly, God already existed in community. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He already existed in community. He didn't create us just for some community because he was lonely. See, God created us to experience the gift of relationship with him. He wanted us to experience the gift of relationship and love and his love. The reality is that there's no place and no way that relationship can exist without choice. You, it, without choice, you have no relationship. Without choice, you have no relationship. The reality is is that we have to have choice. Love has no meaning or existence without the vulnerability of being rejected and walked away from. Now listen, the most amazing, rewarding, life-giving fact of my marriage is that now for 26 years, I've been, Tina and I have been married for 25, but we fell in love before that. And so for 26 years of being in love, Tina still shows up. Now, you may not think that's a miracle because Tina's a good person, but I've given her reason to not show up. And the fact that she shows up and chooses me. In fact, you might be surprised to know this. Tina was, uh, uh, a lot of people liked Tina in the, in the day when we were, before we were married. And two months before we got married, an old uh, crush called her up and said, you're making a big mistake with this guy. And she hung up the phone and she said, I choose him. You see, relationship has all of its goodness in what? In the choice. When somebody chooses you, when somebody says, I'm committed to you, when somebody wakes up in the morning and says, even though yesterday was a hard day, today I choose you, that's why it also can be the greatest hurt. Because somebody can stop choosing. And when somebody stops choosing, and you put yourself into a relationship and a love relationship like that. And so I want you to catch this. If that's true, then that means that's part of the creation. God knows this reality. You see, that's the power of my marriage is Tina choosing for 26 years to stay committed. And if she had stopped choosing and I stopped giving her, giving her the choice, you all would call 911. Because you'd say, he's not even letting her choose. He's forcing relationship with her. He's forcing her to stay. He's forcing her to not get out of this relationship. He's forcing her to be the mother of his children. You'd all call 911 because that'd be a criminal offense. You see, this is the power. This is the reality. 
This is what makes love able to be known and experienced and how we experience the benefits and the blessings of it. You see, God could have made a world without good and evil. There would have been no evil, but there also would have been no good. He could have made a world where there was only good and not the ability to choose evil, but that would not be an experience of relationship. That would us be being robots. He could have made no world at all, and we would have missed out on the gift of relationship and love with him that he wanted us to experience. Or he could have done, did what he did, which is a world of goodness with a choice so that we can experience the fullness of what love and relationship has. You see, this is the best option because it's the only way where love and relationship are possible. It's the only way. In the way, in the place where there's a choice, it's the only place where love and relationship can thrive. God placed the tree of the, in the garden because he wanted most, uh, what he wanted most is for you and me to experience his love. His love. 1 John 4, 8 says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. The apostle John in this verse spoke very clearly that making uh, 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 the choice to love is a requirement for relationship with God. You can't have a relationship with him unless you choose love. Not just choose love with him, but choose love with others. I have to possess the choice of love in order for my relationship with him to be unobstructed. It's twofold, loving God and loving others. If we don't choose to love, we don't choose relationship. And it's as simple as that. God is love and everything Everything he does in our lives is about relationship. The creation was about relationship. His redeeming love and salvation is about relationship. It was you were far off and I want you close. His eternity that he offers us is about relationship. It's I want to be with you, what, forever. Everything he does, every goal he pursues is about relationship. First John 4 continues in verse 18, there is no fear in love because perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. It's not a coincidence that when Adam and Eve made the choice to eat the fruit, the choice that he asked them not to make, the choice that built distance in relationship. It's no coincidence that their first action was based out of fear. I'm afraid. All of a sudden, this God I loved and felt safe with and felt connected to and felt like there was no one who loved me anymore. Now I'm afraid of that person. Now I'm afraid of that person and I have to hide. I have to get out of the way. I have to go to a place where he can't find me. You see, when we choose to love, it removes fear because we're worried about punishment. But when we're loving and choosing to love someone, there's no punishment because there's connection. The difference between being afraid of God and being uh, in love with God is choosing him. That's the difference. When you choose God, there's no fear of God anymore. This is why I worry when I get in counseling with somebody and somebody's always afraid. Maybe they're always afraid of what God's thinking about them, what he's going to do for them, what, how he's going to answer their prayers, whether or not he'll even show up for them. And, I, and the first question I want to go back to is, do, do you know him? Do you know him? Because if you knew him, these issues would be settled. These issues would be settled in you because you would know his love, and you would know there's no reason to fear. You know, one of the greatest things that makes me sad as a pastor is are, the, uh, are those that I know that are still hiding. It's the saddest thing in the world. They know who God is, and they know his offers of love, and they know that he's a forgiving God, and they know he's a graceful God, but yet they still have areas in their life where they're hiding. It's the saddest thing in the world as a pastor. Because what you ultimately know is, is that their fear that God will do something bad to them is larger than their confidence that God will love them no matter what. When we hide, even when we are struggle, 
even when we make bad choices, even when we're, we give ourselves full way to sin, when we hide rather than say, yes, it's true, I made that choice, but I need to be restored from that. When we hide, our fear has kept us from knowing and experiencing God's love. That's what Adam and Eve did that, that day in the garden. See, when Paul prayed, when Paul prayed for the people that he loved, the people that he pastored in the church of, of Ephesus, listen to how he prayed, what he prayed for them about. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18, I pray that you may have pow the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with to the measure of all the fullness of God. You see, that's what his, his ultimate desire is. I don't want you to miss this. If you miss this, you're going to miss him. And if you miss him, then you're going to miss out on all the things that come in this blessed relationship of love. I pray that in the midst of all that's going on and the craziness and the busyness and your mistakes and your choices and the places where you let other things crowd in, I pray that you will have the power to grasp how, how wide, how high, how long the love of God is for you. It's the saddest thing. Listen to me. Listen to me. Let's not be naive. The reality is, is that every one of us in this room struggle in some way with the same choice Adam and Eve struggled. It's not about a tree. It wasn't about fruit. It was about a choice. A choice to say, I choose you versus I choose something else. And when we make that choice and we struggle with the temptation, whatever it is, I'm going to say this again to, 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 to make it, to drive it home. Whatever it is, you say, no, pastor, no, no, this one's really bad. Whatever it is, by the way, there's no sin you can surprise God with. He's not going to go, <gasps> you did that? He's heard it all, seen it all, restored it all. Whatever it is, stop choosing hiding because what you're doing is you're focusing on what potential discipline he's going to do to you rather than the love he wants to give to you. What he wants for you most of all and why he even gave the choice to begin with is that he wanted you to feel the full weight of his love in your life. The full weight. And that should draw us to him. That should draw us to him. Secondly, the life lesson we need to learn in this scripture is this. Just because I'm free to choose doesn't mean I'm free. God has never changed. In his desire, his longing for a loving relationship. And the choice is still given. Do you know that the choice, same choice was made in the garden is the same choice still given today? Except for your, your tree might be uh, um, uh, uh, dishonesty. Your tree might be an unfaithfulness. Your tree might be lust. Your tree could be stealing from those that something that doesn't belong to you. You see, the choice still remains and the choice is given. The power to choose is all, uh, all ours, but so are the results. The choices we make, the results are ours too. I made the choice and that result is mine. You can't be like Adam and go, she, she made me do it. It's ours. It's ours to bear. Adam and Eve found that out with their choice, brought on by hardship, brought on by difficulty in their life, brought on by separation they felt, not just physically, but most of all, relationally. Relationally, they figured out that the, co the consequence of their choice came, that came with their choice was theirs to bear. The difficulty that they 
allowed to come into their life. You know, Israel, the, the nation of Israel, God's people experienced the results of their choices by walking out relationship. And sometimes they did it really, really good. And sometimes they didn't do it so good. And as Israel was walking with God, it was always his call. It was always his cry. Stay in relationship with me. Doesn't matter what those other countries are doing. Doesn't matter what these other peoples are doing. Doesn't matter what other temptation you have. Stay in relationship with me. And Jeremiah recalled a moment where they didn't do it. They didn't choose him. They chose themselves. They chose their own way. They chose their own temptations. And Jeremiah was living in that time of exile because guess what? The consequence came. Exile came, punishment came, hardship came, difficulty came. And Jeremiah talks about this moment in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 19. I remember my affliction. He's saying, I remember the bad stuff that happened when we did that. I remember my wandering. I remember the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Isn't that a horrible moment when we make a choice we shouldn't have made and it just starts to set in? Every one of us has been there at one point or another. We gave into a temptation. We made a choice. We did something we shouldn't have done. And you know what ends up happening? It no longer becomes about the thing that drove us there. Now it's just all we can focus on is the fact I blew it. I blew it. I blew it again. And we get overwhelmed with our failures. We get overwhelmed. And he says, it's just setting in. I remember what I chose, what we chose as a nation and what happened. But he goes on, listen. He says, I yet, this I call to mind and therefore I, I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his com uh, compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, I say to myself. The Lord is my portion, and therefore I wait for him. You know what Jeremiah was convinced of? No matter what choice they made, no matter what conclusion and consequence came their way, there was still hope because there was a God who wanted most of all that they would know his love for them that is still there, that is still fighting on their behalf, that is still running after relationship, and that his hope was not the fact that he would never fall again. His hope was that there was a God with new mercies. You serve the same God today, a God with new mercies. A God that has mercies new, brand new every morning. This is our hope in the midst of the choice and the struggles and the temptations. And even, yes, in the failures. His mercies are new every morning. The Lord is my portion. Great is his faithfulness. You see, choice can not only lead to freedom and blessing, but it can also lead us away from it. It can lead us away from it. Jeremiah's one hope in that moment was that he remembered God is a God of new mercies. In the state of Louisiana, there's a prison, and it's called the Angola Prison. It's the Louisiana, Louisiana State Penitentiary. It's called Angola Prison. And for, forever, since the 1800s, it's been known as the worst prison in the United States of America. In fact, in the olden days, when prisoners got checked in, inmates got checked in into this prison, they would literally issue them a knife to protect themselves. Because without it, you're not going to make it. That's how bad it was in the old days in this prison. It's known for its violence. It's known for its cruelty. It's known that it's just out of control. And everybody who's ever tried to come along, every warden that's ever tried to come along, never was able to fix it, even into the 1900s. Could not fix it, could not fix it. 1995, a new warden showed up. And it was his goal, his desire, his hope, his prayer that he could change Angola prison once and for all. And so he did a radical thing. He said, I want you to put a Bible in every cell. We're going to have chapel every day. We're going to, he says, I'm going to go seek funding and get grants. And we're going to open up a Bible sem uh, a seminary right here in this prison. And everybody looked at him like, 
um, this isn't fairyland. This has been going on for decades and decades and decades, and you think you're going to fix it with a couple of books in the cell? He says, I don't care what you think, we're doing it, and because he's the warden, it stood. So he begins to do that. He begins to invite pastors to come in and speak at the chapels. He begins to start the, the seminary, and at first it was a pretty slow go. But after a few years, wouldn't you know it, the Angola prison ended up being one of the safest in Louisiana and later on one of the safest in the United States. And instead of people, gangs, uh, uh, walking the halls looking to inflict punishment and pain and harm on people, it became a prison that was known for a gang of preachers running up and down the halls telling people about their need for Jesus. A well-known evangelist went to go visit after the change had happened to Angola Prison. And he went to a church service there, and there was a young man leading worship. He was known as the worship pastor of the prison. Only thing is, was he was uh, committed for life. He was one of the inmates. But they called him pastor before his name. And the evangelist pulled him aside and he says, how do you, how do you deal with it? How do you feel? How, what's, what are you, what, what are you, what's going on with you and the fact that you know Jesus, you've been set free, you know you've been forgiven, but you know you're in here for life. This is what he said. I, I wanted to write the quote down specifically so you could hear it word for word. He said to this well-known evangelist, if you'd known why I was here, you'd never ask me that question. He said, but let me tell you something. Out there, I thought I was free. But I did horrific things. And I destroyed people's lives. And I destroyed my own. He says, but now, in here, behind bars, I have found Christ. And I have never been freer in my life. This is the most free I have ever been in my entire life. So would you do me a favor? When you leave here, will you pray for my family? Because my family that's out there who are free to make whatever choice they make, and they think they're free, but they're, they don't have any freedom in their life at all. They're really not free. You see, just because you have the freedom to choose doesn't mean you're free. When you truly know God through a relationship with Christ, making your, own, uh, 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 um, making your own choices is not what's most important anymore. Walking in a relationship with God is transformative. It changes everything about us. And so to think that you can have relationship with God and experience the full measure of his love and not be transformed is to completely misunderstand what serving God is all about. If you can try to say you can serve God and stay who you are and not have God change you, then I would submit to you there's something missing there. Diagnose yourself. Because the love of God, the relationship with God is transformative. When you come into relationship with, with him, it is not about, oh man, I got to do what's best for me anymore. It's about, I just want to walk in relationship with him. He's changed my life. He set me free. He's given me the ability to know what real love, real relationship is all about. You, be, you realize that true freedom in life comes with a life-giving, loving relationship with the one who created you. The power of revelation comes from having the ability to make choices about uh, God and about your life. You start realizing these choices that I'm making they matter. They facilitate relationship. God said this to his people on the way to the promised land. They had just delivered them from, from Egypt. He's taking them to the promised land. And this is what he said to them. And I believe he's still saying this to us today. He's still saying this to the believers. He says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15 through 16, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him and keep his commandments decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But it goes on in verse 19, and it says this, I've set these choices before you, and heaven and earth are witnesses against you 
And then in big exclamation points, it says, choose life. Man, he is screaming from heaven today for every single one of us. Choose life. I want you so badly to choose life. But I can't make you do it. Because if I do, you'll never understand the fullness of relationship. But choose life. Choose it. This is the power of God calling out to us. You have the choice. And just because you have the choice doesn't mean that you are going to walk in freedom. Choose relationship with the life giver. Choose to walk with him again in the cool of the day the way that Adam and Eve did. Do you know he'll come to you in your cool of the day? By the way, that just represents the best time of the day for relationship. The best time of day for relationship. It's the time of day when you're not focused on everything else. You're not distracted. You're not busy over here doing this and going, yep, yep, yep. You know how you have conversations when you're busy? Your spouse comes and talks to you and you're going, yep, 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 yep. And they're like, you're not even listening to me. And you're going, yep. <laughs> cool the day is when eyes locked on one another. Relationship. There's no more distractions. There's no more things to do. Walk with him again in the cool of the day, in the place of relationship. He's the life giver. He's the one who created you, but he's the one who gives you life every single day. It's amazing how one time of choosing relationship writes my life. I want, you, I want to explain that for a second. One day, I mean tomorrow, I choose to come in relationship with God in the cool of the day. It's amazing how that will write my life, write my week, write my month, write my year. You see, here's the reality. If I don't spend time with God in the cool of the day, eventually my wife's going to figure it out. Not because she knows, just because she can see it all over me. And eventually my kids will figure it out if I go long enough. And then eventually the staff here at the church is going to figure it out. They're like, I don't think Lance has been with Jesus for a while. And then eventually my friends are going to figure it out. And then you know what happens? Then all of you start figuring it out. Because what happens is, is I haven't spent time with him in the cool of the day. Things just haven't been righted. And so things just start to compound. And compound. And compound. See, this is the invitation. This is the beauty. Yeah, you got a choice, but not all choices are equal in their blessing and benefit of their life. Choose life. Choose relationship. Choose walking in the garden, spending time with him in the cool of the day. Choose relationship and walk in the relationship that you were born for. Lastly, this morning is this, is I have every reason to trust God. I have every reason to trust God. You see, what was it truly at the heart of Adam and Eve's choice was trust issues. I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but how many of us got trust issues in here? You know how you get trust issues when people let you down. And you get trust issues when you think somebody's holding out on you. When somebody's holding out on you. Well, that was Adam and Eve's problem. They thought that God was holding out on them. This is what he says. I've given all of this to you. Just don't eat that one thing right there. It's all good. It's all pleasing to the eye. It's all amazing. It's all perfect. Just don't. And you know what? Instead of saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. Look at this. This is amazing. Look at this. They said, what is he holding out on us over there? How come he won the, what's so special about that thing? I want to know what that's about. You see, when we can't, don't choose life, it's about trust issues. And God has told us over and over and over again, he has demonstrated more than you could possibly imagine that he is worthy. We have every reason to trust God. He's not keeping something good from us. When God says don't, it's not because he's keeping something good from you. It's because he's protecting you from something that's going to harm the very love and relationship that he wants to give you. And Adam and Eve don't understand this. He's protecting them, not keeping something. And when it comes to choosing the instructions of God, when you are walking with him, the question boils down every time. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? Do you believe he's trying to lead you into life? Do you think that it's only about him? 
somehow you're just serving his plans and purposes but has nothing to do with you? See, as a leader, as a person who makes decisions that affect other people, I often have people that come to me and want to share what they think I should do. It's just part, it's just, listen, every person who leads people, that's just, that's part of the life. And when they come and share, there's a filter I put things through. Is this about me or about them? Is it about me? Or is it about them? See, some people have a track record of saying, man, I just really care about Lance. I want to I help Lance. Whatever, whatever needs to happen, we just got to help Lance. He needs a lot of help, right? Then that is a different filter than somebody who says, you know what, there's something I want, and you stand in the way of me getting it. You see, this is the thing that we have to understand. What hasn't God done to prove his love and trust for you? What hasn't he done? Even when they made the choice to eat the fruit they shouldn't have eaten. He says, we need a plan of salvation. And he leads the entire world. If you read the the Bible from front to back, what you're going to realize is is God was on a pursuit, a single-minded pursuit, that no matter what choices we made, he's going to find a way to redeem us and restore us. Where? Back to the relationship and love he created us for. This is how we get Jesus. It's how we get the cross. It's how we get resurrection. It's how we get eternity in heaven with him. It's all about one thing. He has proven that he is trustworthy and he's not keeping anything from us. He's got our best interest in mind. He has given us every reason to trust him. He has successfully made the case that the choice we have in front of us is to love him in relationship and to walk with him and to cho- or to choose to go our own way and to receive the brokenness and the difficulty that comes with it. Really hard choice, huh? Joshua, the leader of Israel. Like I said, Israel was a, sometimes they were on, sometimes they were off. But he led the people of Israel. When he came into leadership, they were in a place of difficulty. No land. They were outside the promised land. They were on their way. They were still in the wilderness. And he led them from a place of difficulty to a place of blessing and prosperity and promise and victory in their life. Symbolism of what God wants to do for us. And when he got to the end of his life, and he got to the end of his leadership. He was going to step down from leadership. He started noticing something among his people. He said, you know, that things that got us here are things that people aren't choosing anymore. You see, we're only here because we honored and chose God. We chose relationship. We chose love. We chose to walk in his ways. We chose to know that he was for us and not trying to keep something from us. And that's what got us into this place of blessing and prosperity in the promised land. And that's, it's because of him. It's our relationship and connection to him that got us where we're at. But all of a sudden, now that we've got it, he started realizing people are doing different stuff. They got distracted. Other influences coming in, other countries, other people worshiping other gods. They got selfish. They started thinking, what can I get for me? And it became about them, not about God anymore. They started getting tempted they started giving in to things that God had explicitly expressed to them that this is going to kill you. And they started doing it anyway. And Joshua said, this isn't right. What God is here, what, the thing that God is here is the thing everybody's walking away from. I got to do something about this. And so his last act as leader is he got the nation together. It's an awesome story. You read it in Joshua chapter 24. He got the nation together and he says, listen, let me remind you what God did for you. Let me remind you what, what he's brought you through. Let me remind you the victories he's given. Let me remind you the blessings he's bestowed. Let me remind you all of this greatness of God. And let me just tell you something, that this is who God is. And this is what he's done for you. Now listen, if you want to go this other way and you want to do what these other people have done, far be it from me to stop you. But today, choose this day whom you're going to serve. But for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You know what was powerful about that moment? Is Joshua was letting us know something about choosing. Choosing is not a one-time deal. I don't know about you, but I got to choose sometimes to say, I got to be the husband and father I need to be. 
Just because I chose back in 1996 doesn't mean that it's going to be easy to keep choosing. I got to choose it again. Sometimes I got to choose to be a pastor on Monday mornings. You want me to still do this? All right, I choose. Let's go again. See, the moment of choosing is not just one moment. And if you are here today and you think, I made that choice, I'm safe, I'm sealed, I'm delivered, I'm good, no more choosing, I'm going to tell you something right now. That's going to be really hard to live that out in your walk with the Lord because there's going to be moments where you're going to have to choose again. When he says, choose this day, he was saying, choose today and choose tomorrow and choose next week and choose next month and choose when you're 50 and choose when you're 60 and choose until the day that you meet your maker. Choose this day and every day. But as for me and my house. See, that's the choice that's on the table. And that's the beauty of what God has uh, has put out in front of us. Listen, there's life and there's death. There is blessing and relationship and love, or there's difficulty and guilt and harm that comes our way. But the reality is, is that there's a choice because he loves us enough to give us the freedom to choose. But he has proven over and over and over that he is worthy to be trusted. We do not need to reissue or rehash the case. He has proven every day. Every day is a choice as a day of choosing. Ben, will you come and the team will you come? Would you stand with me this morning? Joshua is talking to the people before he said, choose this day. And he says this. He says, you know, you got all this stuff going around that's going to take you from God. And if doing all that seems desirable to you, knock yourself out. If that's what your heart's beating for, knock yourself out. It's not going to lead to any place good, but I'm not going to stop you. Just remember, though, what you did to get here. If you walk away from that, you're not going to be able to stay here. Because the blessings and the benefits that come, come out of relationship. So choose. Choose who you're going to serve. And I I want to be very clear today. You know, we hear sermons and the response time comes. And you know what we do is we, I'm, not just, I'm saying we because I do it too, is we go, well, I'm saved, so whew. I already chose. No response for me. And I just want to say to you, walking with Christ doesn't look like that. It's not a once chosen, always done. It's a I choose every day. I choose every day. Let me tell you something. The minute you think you don't have to choose in a relationship with your spouse is the day your, your marriage can start having issues. It's just the reality. You know it. Well, eventually, your spouse is going to sit you down and he's going to, or she's going to say, are we, are, we, are we good? It doesn't feel like we're good. It feels like you've stopped choosing me, choosing this, choosing us. We got to choose every day for relationship. And I'm going to tell you the best choice you can ever make, the choice that will feed life into you every single day is to have a cool in the day moment with God. I got other choices of things I could be doing. There's another tree I could be partaking of. Well, I'm going to choose this right now, Lord, to be in your presence, to build a relationship, to right me, to keep me grounded, to keep me solid, to keep me living in the life that you've prepared for me and the love. I love Paul. I'm going to end with this message. Will you just close your eyes for a second? I want to just let this resonate in your spirit. In Romans chapter 8, verse 35, Paul asks a very important question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword He loved us enough to answer his own question. He says, no, no. In all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
right back down to love. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So are you hiding? Are you busy? Are you distracted? Or maybe you're just even choosing something other than him. Today, the challenge of Joshua stands firm. Choose this day. Choose this day. Whom you're going to serve. Is he your choice? Has he been your choice? This week, this month, this day, your priorities, your finances, your relationship. Right now, if you're here today and you have not made the choice or you're currently not making the choice to live in relationship with Jesus, you are currently making a choice for something, some other thing, some other whatever, I, I just believe today is the day of salvation for you. And if you're here today and you are not walking with Jesus, and today you need to choose. You need to choose life. Choose the love and relationship. You need to stop hiding. You need to stop running. You need to stop going your own way and say, I choose him today. I want to choose love, relationship, life. That's you today. Would you just raise your hand? Nobody's looking, just you and me. I just want to give you that opportunity because we all need that opportunity. You need to choose life today. Anybody here in this room? Thank you. Anybody else? If you're here in this room today, you would say, you know what? The reality is, is that there's some choices. There's some choices that really don't fit love and relationship. They don't fit. It doesn't, it doesn't gel together today. I need to make, there's some choices right now. The Lord's already highlighting them for me, that there are some choices that need to be made different today. That's you. Would you just begin to raise your hand? I just want to, just accountability between you and the Lord. I want to know how to pray for you today. The Lord's calling you, speaking to you about some different choices. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Anybody else? I want you to just, Pastor Ben's going to lead us in just a, a chorus here of nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else. I just want to just, I want to just, I want to just end on this note. Nothing else is going to get it done in our lives except for the love and relationship and the presence of God today. And as he d d uh, sings that, I want you right where you're at, for those that raise your hand, I want you just to begin to be, to pray and say, Lord, I want to, I choose you. I live for you. I want to serve you. I want to walk with you. I want to meet you in the cool of the day today. Can we do that? Pastor Ben, would you lead us this morning? Jesus. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else. 
nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. Jesus is coming in the garden, coming to meet with you. Can you hear him? Make the choice for relationship, for love. Make the choice to meet with him and let your life be righted by the work that he's going to do in you, by the words of life he's going to speak in you, for the direction that he wants to give you, for the rebuke that he wants to speak to you, for the training that he wants to give you, the maturity that he wants to employ in you. He created you so that you can experience the love that he has to offer. And so, Lord, I pray for those that raise your hand today, God, there's some choices that need to be righted. And, Lord, we're so grateful today that we serve a God whose mercies are new every morning. Lord, no matter how deep in despair our choices may lead us, God, there's always a day of choosing that is available to us. Because you're the God of mercy. You're the God of faithfulness. You're the God that's pursuing relationship no matter what. And so, Lord, we love you. And I pray, God, today that you will help me, help us choose today, tomorrow, this week, and on. Lord, that we will be the people of your presence, the people of relationship with you. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, everybody said this morning, amen, amen, amen. God bless you this morning. Have a great day. Choose. He's going to be waiting to meet with you tomorrow. Choose to meet with him. Amen. God bless you.